in the Torah. And not actually where we are this week, because I could talk about it more. I mean, that we're in Parsha more, which is really about the priests. But I think you actually have to go to last week's Parsha, which is kind of what we're going to do. We're going to kind of go back in time and talk about our relationship with Hamilton. And last week's Parsha was Kedoshim, which, and, and you probably recognize that word. That's the root Kadosh, which is holy. And you hear, you know, you hear about it all the time. You hear it in, you know, the Kaddish when you're doing the Kiddush. Um, at a wedding, you have Kedoshim, it's all over the place. And that holiness idea, what is so radical that the Torah gets to is that it reminds us that what it means to be holy in the world is completely based upon your actions. And last week, that's really, when you've heard of the golden rule, that's it. That was actually my, my, uh, my bar mitzvah Torah portion. If Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. I can't remember how to chance it but it was my bar mitzvah Torah portion. And it really is about that. It's really about what do you do in the world? And if you do it correctly, that is what makes you holy. And if, if we go back to the beginning of how this relationship started with Hamilton, it was, it's actually the 2016 campaign um, when, you, when the, the election was happening and our country was just completely divided and there were two different campaigns a, appearing to be going on. Um, with the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Donald Trump campaign. Um, and at some point I was starting to wonder, was this a, a haves versus have nots um, discussion? And then I looked around San Francisco and you saw kind of the extreme of the haves versus have nots. And so I, um, I called Jeff Kaczynski and I went downtown to, to meet him at City Hall to kind of bounce some ideas off of him. Um, at the end of the summer. And I said, listen, this is what I'm seeing. What, tell me more. Cause this is, you know, I'm walking around the streets. It seems bad here. I'm reading newspaper articles, but what's really going on. And it was right then when he told me that one in 30 kids in San Francisco were homeless. And it was probably one of the more shocking numbers that I'd ever heard in my life to, to even try to imagine that a, but also b that how is that happening in my city? And I didn't know about it. Cause that number is so unbelievably jarring and I have kids and our whole community is about kids and families. And I realized this massive epidemic, which was sitting right here in our city, which was the worst it had been in as long as we had been documenting. And so we kind of, you know, I, I met with, I met God, I mean, Hamilton for the first time and they connected me with people who Hamilton had helped. Um, and I was immediately lit on fire by this organization. And I got up on Colby Dre and I decided that that was the night I was going to share this story. Um, and that kicked off this unbelievable relationship where we have had um, our, some of our preschool classrooms literally adopting families and trying to figure out how they can help youth and family ed um, doing it, individual families helping um, and raising literally millions of dollars from Emmanuel because there was so much energy that got created. And then not just the energy from Emmanuel, but then it kind of spread throughout the Bay Area. Um, and it, it's been incredible. And I will actually never forget um, that night because you're sitting up there, but you actually get to see everyone's face. And I look up at the top right-hand side of the balcony and there is Ted and his family. Um, and I, I could see tears in their family's eyes when they also were learning about what was going on in our city. And they stepped up in a way that that was kind of the beginning of the relationship. And now Ted sits on the board of Hamilton. Um, and you're going to hear more from him. But it really has been this incredible partnership with these two organizations. And so tonight, I really want us to kind of step into that conversation with all of the faces that you see here on the panel. And we're going to have time for Q&A. Um, I already see some people were throwing their hands up there and wanting to talk. And that's great. We're going to do that a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, we're going to start kind of introducing who's here, what we're doing, and we're going to kind of dive into a deeper discussion about kind of, you know, what we dreamed would happen five years ago, and then getting smacked in the face of reality and where we are now in a pandemic that none of us could have anticipated. Um, so I think I was also told I could have 10 words. I think that counts as a rabbinic 10. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it over um, to Ted, who really has been that just unbelievable partner I mean, literally from the beginning of the beginning, from Cole Nidre when he came downstairs with his family and said, what can we do? And now here he sits. Thanks, Ryan. Um, thanks so much. It's great to be here tonight. 
Uh, and and yes, I was I was there. Uh, it was either 2015 or or 2016, but I'm sure I have the ticket stub somewhere. I should frame it and you know put it with my 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 baseball cards. But uh, it's so nice to be here tonight uh, with with folks from the community. I by the way, I miss the Emmanuel community. Um, I used to complain about schlepping over to the Presidio on Sunday mornings, and now it's like it's like a hole and. And I think in a lot of our lives, especially with young kids, not being able to go over there and and and, and sit together and in, in, in the in the uh, Martin Meyer Sanctuary every Sunday morning. So uh, if if you don't know me, I'm, I'm Ted Maidenberg. Uh, my family and I have been part of the community since 2006. And yeah, five years ago, we were uh, up in the balcony, uh, heard the the sermon. And, you know, our kids were at um, SFUSD at the time and, you know, both Alana and Maisie turned to us and they could do the math and basically figure out that they probably knew one or two kids uh, from their grade who had experienced homelessness over the last year. And that was unacceptable to us. Uh, so we really wanted to try to find a way to figure out how to help. Uh, we volunteered with the garden um as with the uh with sunday school uh Maisie always loved working um uh, outdoors um helping to to trim and intend the garden uh, and we got to know the staff uh both volunteering uh, uh, joining fundraisers and i did my due diligence and i joined the the board of hamilton was lucky to join the board uh last year and tonight i think you know, you're going to hear about Hamilton family, get an update um, since that special uh, Col Nidre. And, and also, I hope we're really going to talk about what it was like for Hamilton families and the participants in 2020 during the, the pandemic. Uh, when the world was being turned upside down, schools being canceled, travel was freezing, work was being disrupted. Um, I saw firsthand how the staff and the leadership uh, never missed a day of work. Uh, the, the families experiencing homelessness, the pandemic was there, but they were still uh, needing support. Uh, and, you know, from the leadership of, of Jason, who I think is, is online, uh, to Kirill, uh, and, and the staff at the shelters and all the way down, it was just unbelievable to see them step up. And it made all the inconveniences that I was feeling during the pandemic feel very small. So again, I'm really excited to be here tonight with Rabbi Bauer, Paula, and um, and of course, I'd love to, uh, I'm really excited for you all to meet uh, Kirill, our new CEO. Uh, but before we do that, I'll pass it to Paula to do introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Rabbi Kirill. It's nice to be on this panel. And I see there are over 40 people uh, in the audience. Welcome. Great to know you're out there. You can see us, we can't see you, but um, keep putting your names in and um, we, we, do, we know who you are. I am Paula Pretlow, as Ted said, I'm a proud member of the Emanuel community and partner to Hamilton Families. I'm really passionate about supporting children and families in our community and investing in infrastructure that helps disrupt the cycle of poverty for children and provide scaffolding to young people who experience trauma and help them build stability in their lives and beyond that to thrive. Since learning about Hamilton's work and strategy, I've personally volunteered, gotten to know the organization and have supported Hamilton. I really got to know Hamilton more through Rabbi Bauer and the work that we're doing uh, through Emmanuel. So I too, like Ted, was inspired and inspired to, to do more. I'm also here tonight as a trustee of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. And as a foundation, we're, we've provided programmatic grants to Hamilton families over time. I was really, really thrilled and so happy to work with Hamilton families over this past year and support them during the COVID crisis. What we did was provide grants to support basic needs and provide food to families in crisis. Providing food through local restaurants who were catering to Hamilton families was a double, double benefit. It benefited small 
uh, local restaurants and it benefited the families who were so in need of, of just of food and basic supplies. You know, before moving to San Francisco in 2010, uh, I spent decades before that commuting from the East Bay into the city for work. Over those years, I watched the homeless population grow over time. But even more concerning and disturbing to me personally was seeing the growing number of young people, of children, and of families on the street. And as someone who cares deeply, someone who can't look away, instead I ask, what can I do to help? I couldn't just shrug my shoulders and turn away. And I found a way. And I think each of us is on this call tonight because we're all interested in finding a way to help solve the problem. And with that, Rabbi, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Paula. Um, and I'm so appreciative you're here tonight, Paula. I, Paula is my partner in a lot of other good trouble that we like to get into, um, but also my teacher as well. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited tonight to introduce Curiel and have everybody get to get to know him because he just joined and became CEO this past October and he had some, he had some giant shoes to fill um, with Tamika, um, leaving and stepping on to, to New Vision and some just incredible things. Um, and it's been quite a connection. I mean, because first off, just his background, he has more than 20 years of leadership experience in San Francisco. Um, and really, if you look at his life, he's dedicated his life to solving some of the biggest challenges in our community, um, leading work at Jim Ventures, doing work at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and at Glide. Um, I will tell you, in my first meeting with him, it was because, you know, I don't just talk to people in the Jewish world. I go to outside the Jewish world. And so I'm having my outside the Jewish world meeting. Uh, turns out he's a religious scholar. And so halfway through the meeting, we like hit the pause button and we start talking Torah um, and not like light Torah, deep Torah. Um, so he's awesome. So I'm really excited for um, to meet him. And I'm going to just, I'm going to hand it to you um, to introduce you of Kirill. Just kind of just tell us something about you um, as we start this conversation. Sure. Thanks so much, Rabbi Bauer. I really appreciate the generous introduction. Great, great to be on a panel with you, Ted, and with you, Paula. Uh, really an honor to be with the Emanuel community tonight. Um, since my first days at Hamilton, I learned about how deeply the Emanuel community has stood up to support our work and our mission here in San Francisco. Like Rabbi Bauer mentioned, I had an opportunity to meet with him and pick his brain about a piece of scripture that had intrigued me for many years. So it was great to sort of finally hash that out with somebody who knew better than I did what was going on with that piece of scripture. Um, I also got a chance to meet with Vivian and hear about her many years of work with the local after school program. Uh, I can already tell that this community has a strong commitment to social justice like I have, and I'm excited to learn more about you and your work and continue to work with you towards building a better world. Um, I grew up in New York City originally um, in a low income community, but with a strong in a strong Muslim community. Um, and I had incredible parents who were able to afford me with some pretty pretty sensational educational opportunities. And so given those gifts, I feel an obligation to give back to the community that gave me so much. Uh, as I was growing up, one of my closest friends in junior high was a kid named Benjamin Goldfarb. And I remember when we were about 13, going to his bar mitzvah and hearing about this concept of tikkun olam. And at that point, it really sort of, it's it stuck with me. It's now been almost 40 years, oh my God, 30 something years later. And I still, that, that concept still resonates very strongly for me. And I feel a strong obligation to heal the world and address the systemic inequities that lead to the kinds of family homelessness we see in San Francisco and do it in partnership with folks like you. So I'm glad to be, to be here with you. Um, I feel that my work with Hamilton Families affords me a unique opportunity to align our three pronged efforts. One is to continue to provide individual interventions with direct services to the families. Two is around community interventions in public education. And the third is with structural interventions through our work with policymakers and elected officials. My hope over the, in my tenure here at Hamilton Families is to align all of those interventions so that we can narrow the gap between the glaring inequities that we see now and the utopia that we think we can, that we think we can create here in San Francisco. So can I, can I, can I just jump into it then with you? Would that sure. be okay? Because yeah. 
I mean, it's like when Paula describes that, I think all of us see this, it's getting more intense um, in the city and, I, and you're on the ground. That's us just kind of sitting on the outside watching. Um, what has actually happened today in our community with families and with children who are experiencing homelessness? What are, what are you seeing? That's a great question. I'll start with sort of general, just to give you a general sense of what's, what's happening in the city of San Francisco. Every two years, the city does a San Francisco point in time count. And the last count was done in January, 2021, but those, that, those, that report hasn't been published yet. So we're still looking at 2019 numbers. And in the 2019 numbers where the count found nearly 10,000 homeless people, at, which was a 30% increase since 2017, the last, time, the last count, time the count was done before that. And we know that this is an undercount because families and youth tend to be underrepresented in the point in time count because they tend to be doubled up in cars, in hotels. They're not really on the street to be counted. Um, but the, and the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing estimated at the time that the actual number of people who were experiencing homelessness over the course of that year was closer to 20,000 people, which was nearly double the official count. So that's kind of the sort of a general picture of where we are with homelessness in the city of San Francisco. And with regard to families, um, we at Hamilton Families have been experiencing a very slow but steady increase in family homelessness. For example, when we launched Heading Home in 2016, uh, San Francisco Unified reported that there were 1,800 homeless students in the district. But last year, in 2020, the district reported over 2,500 students experiencing homelessness in the district. So, this, so the problem is growing. And um, given the situation with the pandemic, I think we're painfully aware that there are going to be more families who are experiencing home, who experience homelessness and housing instability during the years to come, as the economic effects of the pandemic continue to affect our families. Um, even though this year has been devastating for a lot of people and for many families, the eviction moratoriums have kept things at bay temporarily. But I think as those moratoria dis dissipate, uh, we'll, we foresee that we'll serve a huge influx of new families over the next couple of years. Um, during a regular sort of non-pandemic year, we serve roughly 100 families with eviction prevention support, providing them with back rent and counseling and work with their landlords, et cetera. But in 2020, we only served 17 families in part due to the, evic due to the eviction moratoriums uh, so that families could stay sheltered in place during the epidemic. Uh, but as the moratoriums get lifted, I think we're gonna see more families needing eviction prevention support and also rapid rehousing. Um, one thing I think I, I want to have stick with the, with, with the audience is that it's important to note that the impact of homelessness on children and parents is profound. The experience of homelessness is traumatic with lifelong effects on kids' social and emotional well-being. Uh, it affects their ability to attend and succeed at school. And children who experience homelessness are seven times more likely to experience homelessness as adults. Seven times. I mean, that's not insignificant. It is, it is a significant problem. So the, the more that we can keep that experience of homelessness short and one time, the better off the kids in our programs will be. I remember uh, that number that was also part of the discussion was that, you know, we talk about the, the cost you know, just dollar and cents thing. And you realize, well, for our country, the best thing to do, let's take care of it right here. Because then if we don't, it just gets bigger as time goes on. Exactly. The problem continues to snowball. And, you know, there's, we'll also have drains on the criminal justice system, on the foster care system, on the emergency services systems. All of these systems, you know, get impacted when, you know, that we have continue to see a steady stream of particularly young people who are experiencing homelessness on the street. So our work, we see our work as being critical to disrupting the cycle of poverty for children and supporting the financial stability of their parents. Um, and one of the families that I wanted to highlight tonight um, was the family that we worked with over this past year. Uh, we had a family with a mom named Kate, who was a single mother with two teenage sons. And as someone who has two teenage sons, that's a lot already. Um, she was thankfully reasonably stable financially but um, she was and her family, they were living through a domestic violence situation and this, her situation was not, wasn't safe. And so she needed to move her and her kids out of her family home and into, um, into a new living situation. Thankfully, she was able to move her family into a new apartment in the Excelsior um, and she was doing all right for a while. And then the pandemic hit, she lost her job like so many others did. And she was on the verge of losing her housing and being out on the street with her kids. Somehow she managed to get to Hamilton Families for eviction prevention services. And we were able to help her keep her family housed. We paid some background to work with her with, uh, some ca with a case manager. And we kept the whole situation from devolving any further. And since then, 
Kate's been working with our team on receiving rental assistance. She's getting coaching from our staff. She's getting a lot of support. And during the time that she's been working with us, she's had some space to take some classes. And she's currently got a really great job working at San Francisco Unified School District. And you know, that's a you know, that 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 particular story is a success story. And I think that we're gonna see we're gonna see more families in that situation who, when the moratoriums get lifted, they're gonna find themselves struggling to pay rent and they're gonna find themselves needing support. And so hopefully we'll be able to provide that support when we get to that point. I mean, so if I go back to the beginning, um, at least my beginning with Hamilton back to 2016, um, it, it, and it was it was really an idea on paper. And I, I remember right, I think we were looking at Houston and Salt Lake City. We were looking at these two communities and they'd done the rapid rehousing and the stats were like, they were mind boggling. It was you rapid rehouse and it was a 92% success rate. And I think in like a two year period. Um, and so I, I guess I first question is, tell us what has been successful since 2016. Um, but then also I know that we have not hit those numbers. We have actually hit difficulties and challenges that we're not able to succeed at 92% and it's been far lower. And so I just want to talk about that and really kind of dive deep on there. Well, what's going on? Sure. I mean, happy to talk about our successes. I mean, since the time that you talk about in 2016, our work has continued and has grown significantly since then. Um, we continue to run the largest emergency shelter for families in San Francisco, and our capacity is roughly 70 families, and they can stay with us for up to six months. Of course, during COVID, uh, that, com that capacity was diminished for, uh, for spacing, um, but generally speaking, that's you know, one of the mainstays of our, of our programs is our family shelter. We also have a transitional housing program that supports roughly 30 families every year, and we allow them to stay with us for up to 18 months so they can really get stable during that period find uh, employment opportunities get their kids settled in school you know figure their figure out their next step and our housing services program which you probably are most familiar with has been able to significantly scale up to help more families move into permanent housing and achieve stability and we do that through direct financial assistance rental subsidies and working one-on-one -on -one with staff who provide wraparound services wraparound support um, but specifically to talk to your question about heading home and the initiative, um, since then, since 2016, we've served almost 580 families since the initiative was launched. And awesome. we still, it's pretty good. And we still Incredible. have- Incredible. I, I was very- No way to go, but then you got a mazel tub when you do, it's amazing. Thank you. I'm really proud of the staff and the work that we've been able to put in to really make that happen. Um, the initiative is due to sunset in June 2022, and we'll do an evaluation of the program after it sunsets to really see what our best practices were, what really worked, what didn't work, what can we do differently if we want to continue the work around rapid rehousing. And I'm looking forward to that, that part of the process as well, really sort of pulling it apart and seeing, seeing what worked and what didn't. Um, another thing to note about heading home is that you know, the initiative, the public-private partnership allowed us to really scale our programs to meet the need that we're seeing in the community. Um, our efforts prior had been, you know, relatively limited because of our budget size and heading home allowed for a greater budget and allowed for a greater capacity um, to work with families. So to put it in perspective, last year we helped 600 families, 640 families stabilize in permanent housing, which, you know, was inconceivable more than five years ago. And right now, even through the pandemic, we help an average of 20 new families get housed every month as an organization. 86% um, of our families exit our housing program with housing, housing stability, and 71% of those families remain stably housed at least one year after completing our program. So, I mean, we're doing the best we can with the families that we work with, and we're having some success. Um, one of the things that Heading Home has been really good for is increasing public awareness of the problem of family homelessness, that you know, family homelessness tends to be invisible. You don't really see as many families on the street or you know, in soup kitchens. You see families are in cars or in hotel rooms for the night or in RVs or doubled up with other families. And um, Heading Home was such a public initiative that it, it brought increased public awareness that allowed us to um, make investments that are improving the quality of our work with families. Um, it brought us to new partnerships with organizations like Congregation Emmanuel, for example, you know, without heading home, who knows if we would have ever been engaged in this conversation. So partnerships like that were the outcome of the, of the initiative. Obviously, you know, this past crazy year and the subsequent shelter in place complicated the whole thing. It slowed down many of our efforts, it made things more challenging, 
But uh, as Elizabeth Warren said, nevertheless, we persevered. Um, we have managed to invest significant resources in our in uh, in our data and evaluation team, which has uh, afforded us the opportunity to really evaluate what what is working and what's not working, and how can we do our work better. Um, so that was you know a great place to invest some resources. We also took some time to create a strategic partnerships team to help families that we relocate out of San Francisco to find and leverage formal and informal resources when they move to other communities. So for example, we have a family that you know has generations lived in San Francisco and the Fillmore say, and they come to us for rapid rehousing, they're able to find you know housing that they can afford in a place like Antioch or Oakland or however, the chances are good that that family is not gonna have you know, a network of support in that new location. And so our strategic partnerships team helps those families find those resources when they arrive in their new community and, and connect to those opportunities and really sort of help them put down roots in their new community. So we were able to really, that's a new team that came about as a result of our work with Heading Home. And uh, one of the other things that we've been doing is around workforce development. We've realized that it's vital for families to have a stable income if they're going to be stable, if they're going to have stable housing. And so we have were able to this year hire our first, our very first workforce development coordinator, and we'll be hiring, hiring our second very soon to help our families uh, build our build their income capacity so they can have a stable income and, and stable housing. Um, we've also been able to create a staff wellness program which uh, addresses issues of staff burnout and compassion fatigue. And it really allows our staff to better serve the, the families who are, who are in front of us. Um, the other thing I will say is that, you know, the Heading Home campaign has really sort of pushed us to work more closely with partners across the city to solve problems as they arise. And I'm very happy to say that those collaborative relationships have only grown stronger over the past several years. I think I'll pause there. Did I, did I answer your question, Rabbi Bauer? Yeah, no, no. I think that's a big part of it. Is just that we, we, just the cost of this area is so much that as people are spreading out, those networks aren't stable when when they when people move out of here. And so it, you know, it makes Hamilton all the more important because we have to kind of double down on supporting people, um, which wasn't in the calculus in the beginning, but I guess we're learning in the process. We are, and I think we are learning that um, it really is important to connect families to formal and informal networks. So for some people, it's, um, you know, religious communities. For others, it's case managers and schools and, you know, doctor's offices and all of that that sort of allow a family to settle into their new community, you know, and really become stable members in that community um, and not feel like they've been isolated from their networks. So that, that piece is really important. And it's, an, it's a piece that we're growing very intentionally. Ariel, I, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Comment first. Over 70% of the families in your programs are black and brown single moms. Can you talk to us about the systems that are causing this to happen and how Hamilton Families is addressing racial inequities in our community? It's a great question and a complicated one. And the answer is equally complicated. Um, as we know from doing this work, every family's path towards experiencing homelessness is unique. But the systemic barriers create um, themes that pop up across. Even though their individual path is different, there's some themes underneath that we can that we can talk about and think about addressing. And one of those biggest themes is federal housing policy, which you know over the past 70 years or so has created opportunities that generally benefited white men and white women and left families of color deliberately out. Uh, we talk we talk about things like redlining policy and so on and so forth. Um, and even the GI Bill, you know, that did not allow for families to, you know, access opportunities that were afforded, um, that were afforded white families. One of the other big barriers is around gender, that our society has a long history of not compensating women for their work as caregivers. Um, and for black and brown single moms, who they're serving as both the primary breadwinner and the primary caregiver, and so those, those and they're not being compensated in either of those areas adequately. And so the problem, there's a double down on the problem. Um, I think the, one of the other things that we're working around is safe and affordable childcare so that single moms don't have to choose between leaving their kids in an unsafe or a too expensive childcare environment and work. And, you know, that's for many families, that is, you know, those are the horns of a very important dilemma. And, you know, we're working to, to try to figure out how to support families around issues of childcare as well. I think. All of those issues really are undergirded by a lack of generational wealth, you know, caused by you know in a, an inability to own homes 
in particular. Um, and you know, families have basic financial literacy so that when something does happen, you know, a small upset can turn into a huge disaster because they're, they don't have resources to cushion the fall. Um, and so one of the things that we've committed to, particularly during this last year of racial reckoning is, is creating systemic change around racial and economic inequity. So like a lot of other organizations who are, who are working at this time, we're doing the hard work on ourselves first to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion in our own policies and practices with our staff, and also to do that, that same kind of work with our participants in our programs. Um, we are working closely with coalitions around the city to advocate for policies and legislation that will redress some of the imbalances that, are, that we see in our society. Um, and you know, really sort of taking a hard critical look at the ways in which we uh, advocate for um, legislation and, and policies and how they support the families that we serve. Um, one example is that we've been, I had a conversation with board president Shimon Walton a couple, maybe last week, and I learned from him that there are, that there's a reparations work group that's, that's meeting in San Francisco. I had no idea that this was actually a serious conversation that's happening at city hall right now. And you know, I, I'm excited about the work that's gonna come out of that. Even if nothing really comes out of it, it does highlight the question and focus some attention on you know, the historical reasons for the poverty in African-American and Latinx families and, really, and, and is trying to redress those imbalances. Um, I'm also super excited about a conversation about direct cash assistance that's happening across the city. You know, families, you know, there was an experiment, a pilot experiment in Stockton that, you know, gave families, I think it was $500 a month for a year and sort of tracked their economic progress over that year. And, you know, the results were inescapably positive. And I think that those kinds of experiments are things that allow us to have these conversations about direct cash assistance for families that are, and they're happening locally and nationally. And I think, you know, we are, we are working with those progressive conversations to push those things along because we know that they will provide a direct benefit for our families. Um, we know those efforts will lift our families out of poverty and into the stability that we all think that they deserve. So that's kind of in a nutshell where we are. We're trying to do our work on a, an on the ground level and also in the policy space to really sort of push the needle in both from both ends. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I, you know, I know a number of us, you know, referenced the, the pandemic and, um, you know, I know you, you were not here, you know, in, in place in, in March, but it's been such an unbelievable year for the city and, and, and for the country and the world. Uh, you know, I would love to understand kind of the ground level, what you saw with the staff, uh, the participants, how we were able to adjust and, and, and adapt. And, and then maybe are there some green shoots here um, as we see, employment opportunities, the labor market start to tighten again. Maybe we're seeing some more um, availability as far as housing, given some of the move from the city to the suburbs and, you know, never try to waste, uh, a, you know, a, a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. would love to hear if you, if you think that's, that's really an opportunity for, for Hamilton to take advantage of. I think that's, that's a great question. And I think it is. Um, you know, it's it's been a really challenging year, and, and though I've only been around for the last seven months, um, you know, I walked into a situation where I was immediately impressed by the ways in which the staff and leadership stepped up to sort of meet the needs of the families that we serve, and you know, and 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 honestly, continue to adapt without missing a beat. Um, you know, every day, every couple of days, there's something new that we have to adapt to. You know, one of the things that you uh, you raised. Ted just now is that you know the rental market in San Francisco for several months, you know, had uh, had rental opportunities that the rent was going down, and so we're able to secure you know many more units in the city um, for families so that they didn't have to move to Antioch or Stockton or whatever, and they could stay in the city with their own networks. And so we are adapting to you know both the positives and the negatives as they as they arise. Um, but as an organization, I have to say that. It has been a hard year for, for our organizations and its resources. Um, over the past year, we've spent more than a million of million dollars of unbudgeted funds to increase subsidy amounts um, for families who had lost income and 
you know, they weren't able to pay their portion of the rent. So we stepped up to pay their subsidy and their portion of the rent so they could stay housed during the pandemic. Um, we, for many families who were gonna exit our program, we lengthened their subsidies so that they would stay in their housing for the duration of the time. Um, and we provided cash assistance to help cover things like food and utilities. We provided every family with children um, with technology, laptop or, or um, or tablets so that the kids could do distance learning. So, you know, we have stepped up to meet the need and, you know, really sort of taxed our resources to, to, a, to a great level. Um, one of the things I wanted to say about the pandemic is that, you know, as other people have noticed, the pandemic really sort of highlighted inequities in our systems across the board. So one of those inequities are, are we're seeing in education. Kids who are in public school, they've pretty much lost a year of in-person education. My own son among them and other more well-resourced well schools were able to come up with hybrid or other solutions to mitigate against learning loss. I think our kids, many of our public school kids are gonna be, are gonna be behind. Um, and we're, we're struggling to figure out a, a way to support those kids moving forward to mitigate against that learning loss. Yeah. Um, we know I know, I know Kirill, that the public school system was actually a great um, system to help identify kids who were experiencing homelessness. And obviously with Zoom, it's you just don't get that same in-person interaction. Is what what how have you how have you handled that? Is there a new way to to access Hamilton for, for these families? Do we have to think about different ways? We do. So as you mentioned, SFUSD was one of our early partners uh, with providing a pipeline of families experiencing homelessness that were identified by teachers or guidance counselors or what have you. Um, but in the absence of in-person learning, it's been a lot harder to get those referrals. And so we've had to rely on the coordinated entry system for most of those referrals. Several months ago, right around the time that I arrived, we started having a different conversation with SFUSD about taking direct referrals. And I think last time I checked, we were looking at um, having 75 new families from SFUSD uh, do our intake process and so and, and come to us directly. So we're working with them on that system right now um, so that we can really sort of work with that 2,500 you know, kids who are experiencing homelessness in San Francisco Unified School District and get some of those families housed if we can. Um, so yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. if we've learned anything from the 2008 recession, we know that recovery is gonna be long. I was reading a New York Times article a couple of days ago from 2019 that um, reported that it took almost a decade for women of color to get back to where they were before the 2008 recession. So, I mean, even if the economy opens up and everything happens quickly in the next couple of months, you know, Governor Newsom is saying, June 15th, California is gonna open up. Even if all that happens, all the restaurants open up, all the, house, all the hotels open up again, it's still gonna take a very long time for our families to get back on their feet from to where they were before the pandemic started. And I, you know, all of those gains that were made, you know, in that decade between 2008 and 2019, you know, we're back to square one again with a lot of our families. Um, and the reasons for that are pretty apparent. Women of color are disproportionately represented in frontline jobs. They comprise more than half of the workers in critical services, critical service fields like housekeeping, personal care services, nursing assistance. And many of those women of color had the thinnest financial cushions at the onset of the crisis. They had little or no savings and they had fewer resources to rely on when their income was disrupted. Um, black, black and Latinx women also face really high rates of unemployment. 8.8% um, and 8.5% respectively compared to 5.1% for white women. Asian American women are also more like, are the most likely to have been unemployed for more than six months due to the recession. So the recovery is gonna take a while. And I think we just need to, you know, take a long view. You know, Rabbi Bauer, you know, we're looking at, you know, five years already and we've made some progress. We've housed 578 families. That's not nothing. Honestly, that's a fantastic accomplishment. And there's a lot more to do and it's gonna take a lot more time. I mean, you know, it, there, there, there's a section in the Torah that when when we're at Sinai and we receive the Torah, what the rabbi said, what, what it says in the parsha, what it says in the Torah is my seven ishma, that we're going to do it and then we're going to understand it. But it really leads that concept is that the first thing we do is do. And so, you know, given everything that you're describing of where we are, and I have the chutzpah to try to speak for everyone here online. Um, 
because as Jews, that's the question we ask is what can we do? Like what more do you need from us to reach your goals, our goals of ending family home homelessness? It's a good question. And I, my response is um, continued investment, continued engagement, continued partnership and patience. Um, you know, we're currently working on a recovery package for families and we're emphasizing workforce development support, a reimagined childcare system, extended rental subsidies and direct cash system for families. And while we work on that as part of our strategic planning process, you know, we're gonna, con we're gonna need the continued engagement of uh, communities like the Emanuel community, for example, um, you know, in all the ways that you guys show up, volunteering, directly supporting families in our program. I know there's this whole move in supplies, uh, new program, which is really fantastic. Um, a lot of, we've, we've seen a lot of technology coming from your community, a lot of books coming from your community. So a lot of that will need to continue. Um, you can also help as an advocate and spreading public awareness about this ongoing issue. It's not a one and done. Um, I think we're all really clear that this this is a challenge. I've lived here for 21 years and it hasn't gotten significantly or appreciably better in the two decades that I've lived here. And it's probably gonna take a lot longer for us to get it right. And so we need to continue spreading awareness around about the issue because it's not over yet. Um, I think the other ways that, other things that we are gonna need is, you know, adv working with coalition members around advocacy, around things like universal paid medical and family leave, universal childcare, direct cash assistance to families, to single moms, investments in low-income communities, generally speaking, um, longer rental subsidies, more low-income housing, all of the above, all these things are tied together. And, um, you know, we got to take a long view and get to it. I mean, and for someone like me, who is, who tends to be on the impatient side, that part is hard you know, to sort of watch, to take a long view and be patient and know that the efforts that we're making now will bear fruit at some point, but we have to do as Rabbi said, and then understand later, so. Ariel, could you talk a little more about with the statistics that you've talked about, especially among black and brown and Asian women, yes. um, um, talk to us more about what you're looking at and thinking about there? So we're really looking at uh, working with our workforce development coordinator to really sort of help from soup to nuts, really, you know, building a resume, interview skills, providing folks with, you know, appropriate clothing for interviews, um, working with folks on soft and hard skills around um, how to how to conduct oneself in the workplace, how to uh, how to work with colleagues in a professional environment all of the above um, and really sort of partnering with other workforce development organizations like Goodwill and JVS to help uh, help place our participants in jobs where they can make incomes that will support them and their families in stable housing. So really we're imagining like a full wraparound workforce development program. Um, we're, we're gonna start slow. We have, we have only one person so far. We have one staff member. Um, we're gonna hire another and soon there'll be a pair and then we can you know, slowly scale that effort up so that we can meet the needs of, um, of our participants in this area. Can I, I, I do have some questions coming in here and if I could just, um, just read them to you and if you could just give us an answer, it'd be great. Um, hey, does anyone have a number of how much money it takes to get just one family on their feet again. Housing, food, clothing, and what's the rent? And it's a fundraising initiative. How much money does it take to get one family back on their feet? And then overarching, what are the fundraising goals of Hamilton? Um, that's a great question and a real like right to the point question. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's um, not subtle, no. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, I don't need subtle. Give it to me straight. Um, the answer to the question, the dollar amount that we've been using for our calculations is $51,000. It takes $51,000 to move a family, you know, through the whole pipeline into, into housing, including rental subsidies. So that includes staff time, a year's worth of rental subsidy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, so when we look at our goals and we want to, and we want to calculate how much money we need to raise, that's the math that we use, $51,000 per family. And then, and then what is the overarching number for where Hamilton's trying to get to? Uh, the original goal was 800 families, was for us to reach to, for us to house 800 families th through the Heading Home Initiative. Okay. 
So when you do the math, that's almost $40 million. I should have bought Bitcoin earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another question here. Sure. Does Hamilton establish trust with families so that they can feel safe and potentially not feel subject to child protective services or the fear of foster care system, which can tear families apart or loss of existing social networks? I asked this from my experience of homeless when I was an adolescent. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, not really sure how to answer it, but I will say that because our cities, the way that we get families into our services is through the city's coordinated entry system. So those families will have already gone through an intake process with the city already. So whatever, whatever fears, by the time they get to us, they will have been vetted by the city, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, and so there's not really any reason to fear that we're going to you know, somehow six CPS on them after they've gone through that process because they've already gone through the city's hands already before they get to us. Um, so, and for our part, what we do is we try to build relationships with families from the, from the beginning of the intake process such that families can feel trust and, you know, feel safe and supported with us as we shepherd them through the process of getting them, getting them housed. Um, you know, we have an incredibly compassionate and committed and devoted staff who are, you know, who literally bend over backwards to, to make things right for our families. And so, you know, I leave it to the staff to really sort of do, to work their magic, you know, with, with the families to make them feel loved and supported and heard and seen. Um, and, and, and they're really very, very good at it. So I have, I have one, I have a question in here, which, um, well, the first question was, how does Hamilton families help the LGBTQ youth that are vulnerable to face homelessness? Um, and as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Hamilton really is, we, we have different organizations and it's a, it's a particular focus just on families, not on youth. We have other amazing partners that do that. Um, but then a follow, and, and please correct me if I got that wrong, um, is that how long does, when, when we're talking talking about taking care of families, how we talked about the number of what it costs, but how long does it actually take to help a family become stable where it's kind of launched back into life? That's a great question. Um, and to the first part of your, of your question about LGBTQ youth, um, when we have LGBTQ youth, we tend to refer them to Larkin Street Youth Services, which really sort of focuses on that part of the population with youth. And so we're partnered very closely with them. And we've been working very closely with them for years. So um, that's where their expertise lies. And so if there's something particular for that community, we send them to the experts in that in that field. Um, and as to the question of how long it takes for a family to truly get stable, we are learning that it takes a lot longer than we thought, mm -hmm. um, which is why when I talked earlier about potentially having longer subsidies and more wraparound services and really pushing for that, you know, 12 months is not a long time in the life of a family to really sort of turn around generations of poverty, generations of poor access to education, generations of poor financial literacy. I mean, what you're really trying to do is like move a mountain essentially and sort of change its course. And, you know, 12 months, even 20 months for those who are in our longer subsidies is often not long enough. Um, we have families who, because of the pandemic, have been with us for 28 months, 26 months. Those families are you know, hitting really sort of proper stability that we can say, um, but we'll know better. We'll have better data when we do an evaluation of the Heading Home Initiative after June, 2022. But anecdotally, what I'm hearing from staff is that 12 months is not really long enough. It's long enough for families who just need a leg up, like who have everything else right, but they lost their job or one catastrophic incident happened. Someone got sick and they lost their housing. Someone, you know, they lost their income one, to some catastrophic means, but for families who are, you know, truly struggling in multiple arenas, the subsidies need to be longer for them to really get on their feet. Thank you. And so, you know, another question is, are there any other upcoming campaigns that people can help support? I know, you know, we're helping with the moving the toolkits and so on and so forth, but what, what else can we do right now? That's a good question. Um, I know there's some work around the Prop C funds uh, that that's happening. And there's also um, a Mother's Day effort that's happening. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but Hamilton Families does a does a very sweet Mother's Day campaign. Um, I'm going to check our website for for that campaign. There's there's some lovely things to be done there. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. 
definitely check out the Mother's Day campaign. We're we're doing something really exciting there, and um, and then I would you know subscribe to all the Hamilton social channels, the newsletter, and we have an amazing development staff led by uh, Rachel. We we talk about development right now, um, but obviously volunteer is a big piece of how folks get involved, and maybe this summer. I think is is when we're talking about being able to do more more in person. As things open up, the volunteer opportunities that have been that were suspended during the shelter in place will slowly come back online, and so we'll have opportunities for for people to help in person. Which you know, Brian Stevenson always says that you know proximity is one of the things that helps affect change. And I feel like the in person volunteer experience is really eye opening. I know it is for me. Whenever I go to the shelter or transitional housing it really sort of regrounds me in the reasons why I continue to do this work. You know, meeting the families, seeing the kids, hearing the kinds of challenges that they're facing really does sort of change and, you know, deepen the connection. So if you have, if you can, I urge you to, you know, and volunteer in person when that becomes possible. Yeah, I think some of the, I mean, I remember visiting the shelter. Um, we all take it for granted hacking the city knowing when there's a story time at the library or a puppet show at golden gate park or something special happening on cressy field um you know for folks with young kids who need things to do it's you know the there was an amazing just a board of you know free days at the museum uh public transit uh, uh routes homework resources we live in a pretty amazing community that gives back that really wants to be involved and is the beauty of the of the bay area and so much of it is just making those connections uh so i i'm so excited for for this to kind of restart in in earnest me too i really am I and mean, for a lot of reasons i mean <laughs> i mean like everybody else I, I experience pandemic fatigue as well so happy to you know see see it coming to an end hopefully and that and getting us all back back on track and in person providing the services that that are so vitally needed by our community. So Kirill, I just want to thank you, Ted, Paula. Um, I just want to thank you so much for making the time tonight. Um, unbelievably sacred work that you're doing and guiding us in this journey and in this process. And it's this, you know, you know, when you're younger, you think, ah, I just have to run to that point and it's going to be over. And I think as you grow older, you realize, yeah, we got over 500. That's amazing. And now we're getting better at what we're doing and we got to do even more sacred work. Um, and so if I would invite everybody who's listening tonight to reach out to Rebecca Reiner, that's R-R-E-I-N-E-R -E at EmmanuelSF.org um, to ask how you can get more involved in our Hamilton, in the works we're doing directly with Hamilton throughout this. And again, just thank you, Kiriel, and thank you, the entire Hamilton staff, which is just a bunch of rock stars. Um, thank you so much for having us. I really, I'm profoundly appreciative of, you know, the Emanuel community support and look forward to continuing to work with you as we can, as we, you know, really sort of try to get to the bottom of this, this particular problem. Well, thank you all. And I stuck Rebecca's email address in there, which she's going to like it, hopefully. Um, <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks, good everyone. Night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.